To The Point with your host, News Channel 5's Kelly Dunn. Charlie Crist once called George Lemieux the maestro and appointed him to serve in the U.S. Senate. Now Lemieux wants to win the job outright, but will his ties to Crist hurt him? Good morning, everyone, and welcome to To The Point. George Lemieux is a Republican from Lighthouse Point. He is one of the front runners in the race to take on Senator Bill Nelson, and he is our guest today. And joining me asking questions is my colleague, Michael Williams. Thank you very much, Senator, for being with us. Thanks for having me. Let's get to the point. You worked for Charlie Crist. You ran his campaign for governor. You were his chief of staff when he was attorney general, and he appointed you to the Senate. So why did you cut ties with him? Well, Charlie Crist left the Republican Party, and although I'm appreciative for the opportunities he gave me for public service, when he decided to walk away from the values of our party of less government, less taxing, less spending, less regulation, I decided to stick with those values. So the day after he left the party, I endorsed Marco Rubio, I campaigned for him. It wasn't a personally easy decision for me, but it was the right thing to do. Have you stayed in touch with Charlie Chris? Because I understand your children even call him Uncle Charlie, and I mean, you were close friends. So was this a personal and professional split from well, him? Well, look, it's a little strained, as you might expect, and friends have these things that happen during their relationships. He's still my friend. I'm not going to say anything bad about him, but we're just in a different place in terms of our ideals and values at this point. Give us some examples of the policies that Chris enacted that you say, I'm, that's not something I would have, you know, voted for or something I would have done. What, where are your differences policy-wise? Well, I'm a principled conservative Republican. I believe that the federal government's too big. I think the stimulus plan was a waste of $787 billion of taxpayer money. The governor supported that. He also did not want to change teacher tenure in this state. That's something I thought we needed to reform. So, you know, in the last year or two of his administration as governor, he took a different direction. Uh, I stayed with the principles of our party. And yet there are many who argue that without that stimulus money, Florida's economy would have been even farther in the tank. And you talk about principled conservative values, but that's an easy catchphrase. But when it comes to people who needed that help and perhaps rescued the economy from being worse, were you on the wrong side of that issue? Well, I don't know how the economy could be much worse. This is the worst economy Florida's been in in 70 years. We got a million people out of work. We have not seen a lot of infrastructure or public works jobs that have come from the stimulus. Truthfully, only about 50 billion of the 787 was towards those type of projects. But, but should Republicans not take the blame for that? Republicans have had control of the state house and legislature for the long period in the 2000s upon which you're basing that criticism. Well, that's a really apples and oranges issue in my view. The legislature of the state did not appropriate the 787 billion dollars that came out of Washington. What I think we need is less government. What I think we need is less job-killing laws and regulations. What I hear from business people all around this state is there's too much uncertainty coming from Washington. Obamacare, Dodd-Frank, too much regulation out of folks like the National Labor Relations Board or the EPA. We've got to give some certainty to job creators so we can put people back to work. You said you would have voted against the recently concluded deal to avoid a national default, uh, default on the nation's debt. Why, especially given the fact that people say that would have been an even worse problem for the nation's economy had we defaulted on our debt? You were ready to see the nation default on its debt? No one wants to see a default. But you were ready to vote, and you were ready to vote for a default on the nation's debt if it came to that, yes or no? I would have voted no in the United States Senate along with the other 26 folks who I think it was that voted no yesterday, like Marco Rubio. And the reason is this. We have just put a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. The issue is not the debt ceiling. The issue is the debt. It's 14 and a half trillion on its way to 26 trillion. When I was in the United States Senate, I was shocked by how badly this government misspends our money. We spend $200 billion a year on interest payments alone. By the end of the decade, it'll be 900 billion. Our government can't afford to make that payment. We are gonna have what's happening in Greece and Portugal and Ireland and Spain happen here unless we make significant cuts. What would you have said though if you were sitting face to face with a military family who had we gone into default would have been mm -hmm. concerned about getting the money that they so desperately need to survive on. What would you say? I mean this is it's a broad issue and mm -hmm. everybody talks about yes the you know the default but we're talking individuals who would be sorely hurt by this. Well we're all going to be hurt when this government is unable to meet its make its obligations and I feel for the military family. I feel for all the folks who are dependent upon government in whatever way it is, especially those fighting for our safety and freedom, but we should have had a better deal. Now listen, if we would not have had a Republican House, 
they would have just raised the debt ceiling. They did it twice while I was there. I voted against it both times. It was only because we had a Republican House that we even got any type of savings. What we need is a Republican-controlled Senate. If that were to happen, we could have the four, five, six trillion dollars in cuts that we need to really have some legitimate savings from the spending in Washington, D.C. Alan West, no flaming liberal he, voted for the deal, uh, said, listen, right now we have to take the piece of the pie that we can get, of course, I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. There's no politician, Republican or Democrat, who voters here who it seems speaks the truth about the fact that over the long haul, we cannot have everything we want. When you poll people, they say, I want cuts, except no, I don't want cuts to this. I don't sure. want cuts to my program. None of you all speak to that. And find, name one nonpartisan economist who says we don't, over the long haul, need a mix of much more spending discipline and new tax revenue, be that closing loopholes or tax hikes. Name one. Well, look, I think we need new revenues, but I believe, like Marco Rubio does, it's not new taxes, it's new taxpayers. We need to get people back to work. Half the people in this country don't pay any taxes now. That's not right. We've got companies that don't pay any taxes. But we That's tried multi-trillion right. dollar tax cuts under the Bush administration and doubled the national debt. Mm -hmm. Well, look, we've got a spending problem in Washington besides having a revenue problem. The revenue problem is largely driven by the fact that this economy is depressed. The spending problem is by the fact that Congress, with both Republicans and Democrats over the past de decade, has gone out of control with spending. Realize that the national debt was only around $5 trillion in the 90s. We were balancing the budget in 95 and 96. Under a Democratic administration. And a Republican Congress, you'll remember, mm -hmm. both House and Senate. No, beginning now, in 94, Now it's correct. $14 trillion on its way to 26. If we don't bring about across the board revisions in spending, I mean Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, Defense, mm -hmm. and every other program in government, we are going to bankrupt this country, and my four kids and your kids and our grandkids are not going to grow up in the same America that we grew up Let's in. Let's talk about that spending and when it pertains to the military. There's a question on your website about government spending, and let's take a look at that. We're going to bring it up on the screen. John Blessing writes, why is it all <laughs> I hear about cutting spending is domestic spending? Why don't we cut foreign spending? What is your answer to Mr. Blessing? Well, we need to cut all spending, and we need to cut defense spending as well as spending on foreign aid. No one is going to be spared some piece of the budget knife, and that's because Washington has been out of control spending for all these years. I sat on the Armed Services Committee. It was a privilege to do so. I believe that our military is the greatest in the world, and I want it to be the greatest. But I believe that there are tens, if not a hundred billion dollars worth of inefficiency, waste, and duplication in the defense budget. So I'm not one of these Republicans who won't say, you know, oh, don't cut defense, but only cut entitlements. We have to cut everything. Right now, 85% of the budget is Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and defense. Do you support the Ryan plan to create a Medicare voucher system for those under 55? Number one, yes or no on that? Well, I would have voted for it because there was no alternative, and right now Medicare is going to go bankrupt or at least have funding problems in the next years, as soon as 10 years. I have my own proposal. I filed when I was in the Senate called the 2007 solution. Go back to what we spent just three and a half years ago. Cap all federal spending. If we did that, we'd balance the budget in two years and cut $4 trillion out of the debt. Not $4 trillion out of the increase. Realize that's what all these right. programs are talking about, even this one that was just passed, cutting the increase. This would actually cut the debt we have from 14 to 10. Last week, a Florida Senate President Mike Herodopoulos was on this program, and uh, we asked him who he thinks has the best chance of defeating uh, Senator Nelson. And first of all, we're going to play a clip and listen to what he had to say. Well, I would not be surprised if another person gets in the race uh, because of the resources I had and, of course, the endorsements and the accomplishments. A lot of people kind of set out the race. I expect another high-quality candidate to get in, and I wouldn't be surprised if that person is the most successful. He never mentioned your name or Adam Hasner's name at all during our interview. What's it going to take to win over the supporters who were leaning toward Herodopoulos? Well, I've had a lot of those folks contact me in the, the days since Mike has gotten out of the race, and I've got a lot of their support. Look, I've been around the state not only in the 16 months I was in the U.S. Senate, but since that time meeting with people. Uh, we were fortunately able to raise twice as much money as our nearest competitor in this last fundraising quarter. I'm getting the support of grassroots people, of business people. Uh, we're going to keep working hard. I know that I have to earn this and earn the trust and confidence first of Republican voters and then hopefully of general election voters in November of next year. I want to talk about an issue near and dear to a lot of hearts right now in the middle of hurricane season. Every politician who runs for office, whether it's uh, 
running for president, running for senate, running for governor, talks about some kind of regional catastrophic fund because people are being crushed by homeowner insurance mm -hmm. costs, and yet none of those elected officials ever do anything about it. Why should people think you're going to be any different? Do you have a real plan, or is it just going to be more talk, and then we put it off to 2014, 16, and forever? Citizens can't handle the load, and people are calling and writing us saying, we can't pay our bills. Well, Citizens has a million, 400,000 people in it. It's way too big. It's unsustainable. Uh, the private insurance market here is too small. We need more competition. One of the things that we can change in Washington, as I understand it, is that insurance companies are not allowed to keep their reserves on their books, otherwise they get taxed for them. So there is a negative incentive to keep reserves. That drives prices up. That's something I will address if I go back to Washington. But I want to be clear and give some straight talk to the people of this state and this county who are watching this broadcast. There is no impetus in the United States Congress to do a national catastrophic fund. Or a regional one? Uh, I, a regional one would have to be done between like the governors of the different Gulf states. states I think that's possible, but you are not going to get the other one through the U.S. Congress. It's dead on arrival. So we, we're, no, go ahead, no, go right ahead. So we're going to end up continuing to pay these premiums that can go up 15, 20, 25 percent for the foreseeable future. Well, what I would do, like I said before, go back, see if we can change the tax code so that just because an insurance company acts prudent, holds reserves, they don't get taxed on them, that should lower prices. We have time for one more question. You have a debate coming up this month with the other Republican candidates. How are you going to differentiate yourself from them? Well, I have the conservative record in this race. Of the folks who are running on the Republican side, only two of us have held office. I'm the only one who's never voted for a tax increase. I'm the only one who's never requested a wasteful earmark. And I'm the only one who's ever actually been in the United States Senate and has a good conservative record that everyone from the National Taxpayers Union to the American Conservative Union to the NRA to the Chamber of Commerce have evaluated me and given me an A rating. So I think past is prologue. I had a good tryout, and hopefully the people of Florida will give me their confidence come August 14th of next year. And now and forever, yes or no, you'll never vote for a tax increase no matter what it takes to balance the budget if it's decided we need more revenue? We're not going to have to. I'm not going to vote for tax increases. You mentioned tax loopholes before. I'm happy to close them. There's nearly a trillion dollars worth of them. I would spread those tax savings across the board. Let's lower everyone's tax rates. Let's lower the corporate tax rate. Let's get companies more excited about hiring, more competitive, more taxpayers equals more revenues. It's going to be an interesting campaign <laughs> and election. It always is in Florida. Yes, Thank it is. you very much, Senator, Senator George uh, Lemieux, for being with us today. We appreciate your time. Thanks for having me on. Thanks. Coming up next, our roundtable looks at the political fallout from the debt ceiling deal. What is the Delray difference? Lincoln of Delray knows the difference is outstanding quality and value, state of the art facilities, and unmatched customer satisfaction. You've got a lot of choices when it comes to selecting your new car. And Lincoln of Delray, located at Delray Motors, is dedicated to exceeding your expectations. Family owned and operated for over 50 years, Delray Motors is still here for you. What is the Delray difference? Visit us and discover for yourself. Take me away. Take me Florida for the lifestyle. A look and feel we've captured in my new coastal furniture collections. Casual, comfortable fabrics, rich tropical woods, cool leathers, and Florida colors. All at a price you'll love. See the new Cindy Crawford Coastal Collections now at Rooms to Go. I can't wait to be part of your home. Florida law prohibits law firms from using TV ads to discuss their results. So in this commercial, we can't tell you how many cases our firm has won or how much money we've recovered for our clients. However, the law does allow us to put those results on our website at foryourrights.com. We encourage you to visit foryourrights.com to see our results. If you're injured, visit foryourrights.com. Let us represent you at no cost. Vital Writer, Smith, Ivy, and Fraunrapp, for your rights. All across the Sunshine State, folks are looking for something different close to home. A place that's fun and friendly with a cool beach attached. That's where we come in. From the sand to the city, a town that knows how to celebrate good food and music, where you can just be yourself. Hollywood, Florida's hometown beach town. And discover new galleries and restaurants at the Art Walk in downtown Hollywood every third Saturday of the month. 
Live Viper 5 HD at your fingertips. The new WPTV Interactive Weather Center app. Search WPTV in the Apple App Store and download it today. It's time for our roundtable now. Joining us is George Bennett, the political reporter with the Palm Beach Post, and Greg McBride, a financial analyst with Bankrate.com. And we're going to be talking about the debt ceiling and politically and economically, how it affects people. But first, I want to start, George, and give us some feedback. You just heard uh, George Lemieux. What do you what do you want to say about what he just told us? Well, you know, the Senate race, I mean, we're still 13 months out from the primary. But in, in a way, these guys, uh, the, the major candidates, Lemieux and Adam Hasner, uh, kind of have to ramp up their campaigns with, with Herodopoulos getting out of the race and suggesting maybe somebody else is going to get in. They need to uh, shore up support and money, you know, now to try to, as a kind of preventive measure to, to avoid getting somebody else in the primary. So even though it is 13 months from the primary, there's, it's a little more intense than it might otherwise be. Talk about the, the debt deal, uh, all the acrimony in Washington, how it begins to shape the debate as we head towards 2012. And of course, that's slightly unknowable given that we don't know what the impact, positive or minus, is ultimately going to be. But give us a sense as you looked at that debate and where you see it shaping well, Florida politics. Well, one thing, I mean, and this debate has been going on for a couple months, and so people have gotten accustomed to it. But I mean, if you take a bigger historical perspective, I mean, the, the debt ceiling bill has normally been a standalone vote, and whoever's in the minority party votes against it and maybe rails about fiscal responsibility. But basically, it's a one day story. The thing gets voted on, and they borrow more money. The, the fact that there was this conversation for months about spending levels and the size of government is uh, is a victory for the Tea Party. I mean, the Tea Party was unhappy with the final result, but just the, the fact that this was on the table for, for this long is a discussion that they wanted to have and, and you know, hasn't happened before. But it seems like it further polarizes the debate. You're seeing some nasty editorials, nasty talk out of Congress, Democrats calling it a Satan sandwich, some editorial writers calling uh, the Tea Party activist, uh, American Taliban, a jihadist. I mean, some really nasty talk that, frankly, some say if it came from the right and it was directed at the left would not be tolerated. Does it further polarize the debate and, and the sensitivities in Florida going into next year? Well, I think there'll be plenty of more polarizing that goes on. I mean, I mean, the next big fight is going to be this uh, super committee that's going to decide on more spending cuts. And, yeah. you know, whatever they come up with is going to be a wrestling match and then what Congress does with it. So, uh, you know, I don't know 15 months from now that people remember this, uh, the particulars of this debate, but... Well, and Greg, does, you know, does this deal necessarily calm people's worries about the economy? You still have very high unemployment. The housing market is a mess. So what do you think it does? Well, it's just removed one cloud of uncertainty, but unfortunately it's been replaced by a new and maybe even bigger cloud of uncertainty with regard to the health of the economy. At the same time the debt ceiling was being raised, we got hit with a barrage of bad economic news over the course of the last week, and now people are questioning whether or not there's sustainability to the economic recovery. So it's quickly, it's, it's like when we're watching on the hurricane maps. As soon as the hurricane turns and goes a different direction, we're back to worrying about the everyday things that we worry about. Right. Strictly through an economic prism, not the political one. Mm -hmm. George and everybody else can talk about that. But from the economic prism, is this deal really fundamentally one that helps the economy right now? There's a lot of argument that we need more spending in the economy right now. Where do you see it from that point of view? Well, on net, anytime you cut government spending, it's a drag on the economy in the sense that a quarter of our GDP, of our total economic output, right now comes from government spending. So any cutbacks are a drag on, on growth. However, the, those spending cuts are spread out over 10 years, and it's very minimal in the short term. So I don't see much of an impact economically in the short term, positive or negative. It's, it, I think the significance of the debt ceiling is the catastrophe that was averted. Mm. The, the, the fact that, you know, as, as George was alluding to, that you know, raising the debt ceiling is normally a very perfunctory matter. The fact that this was dragged out and coupled with spending cuts is really what added so much uncertainty. Right. Coming up next, what we can expect one year from now after this. This hurricane season, when the weather changes, you'll want an early warning. The most powerful weather radar. A calm before the storm. Live Viper 5 HD. So accurate, so powerful, it can track severe weather before it gets to your neighborhood. Sure, it's about the wind and the rain, but it's also about your safety and an early warning so you're prepared. This hurricane season, count on Storm Team 5 and the power of Live Viper 5 HD for early warnings that'll keep you safe and secure on air, online, and on your mobile device. Today we're going to be cleaning some air ducts. Well, maybe your AC is not working as well as you think it should. Or maybe your allergies are worse than usual. Well, I just had my air ducts cleaned a couple years ago. How dirty can it be? Oh! oh that is disgusting. So you want to take a look up there? No. Oh. 
This <gasps> is what we pulled out of your duct. This is all the stuff you're not going to be breathing anymore. So how are your ducts these days? Are you sure? Call Stanley Steamer for a free estimate. Trust me, you'll be glad you did. These sweet, clustery things have fiber? Fiber one. Almost tastes like one of Jack's cereals. Ugh, oh, I forgot Jack's cereal. What's for breakfast? Um... Try the, uh, number one. I've never heard of it. It's great. It's a sweet honey cereal. You'll love it. Yeah, it's pretty good. Are you guys all right? Yeah. Mm. Half a day's worth of fiber. Not that anyone has to know. Fiber beyond recognition. Fiber one. Experts come in all shapes and sizes. From standard checkups to advanced life-saving care. Our experts have built something bigger. Better. Amazing. It's South Florida's newest freestanding children's hospital. It's where our experts will keep your experts doing what they do best. The new Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital. In Wellington, watch Roxanne Stein on News Channel 5 for local coverage you can count on. This morning, we're looking at the political and economic fallout from lifting the debt ceiling. And uh, George, with both Republicans and Democrats uh, voting in favor of raising this, is this going to become a weapon during the campaign season? Uh, it, it could. You know, I, I think it was Senator Lemieux's campaign the day of the vote uh, uh, sent out something accusing Bill Nelson of voting for the largest debt uh, ceiling increase in history, which is, which is true. Um, but, it, it, you know, I, I'll tell you, um, it, it was bipartisan, and so, you know, it's hard to, to have the kind of traditional avenues of attack. I think one person that probably benefits from this politically is, uh, and locally is uh, Congressman Alan West. Uh, he, he went against the Tea Party, uh, both on a House uh, vote leading up to it and then on this. And so, you know, to the extent that he's going to be portrayed as this wild-eyed, radical Tea Party extremist, he, here's a concrete example where you can say, you know, I have went against the Tea Party. Mm -hmm. This debate may fade soon in voters' minds, but the jobs picture won't. Greg McBride, are we headed for a double-dip recession uh, next year with all the data you see? What are the concerns? What are the odds compared to a few months ago? Those odds have really gone up just in the past couple of weeks. It has nothing to do with the debt ceiling vote, but uh, it will be a front-page concern. And, and, and what are the fundamentals, just very briefly, that lead you to think we're headed that way? Well, the hub on the wheel is jobs. Consumer spending is off, uh, that, you know, and, that, and a lot of that ties back to income. Housing market, again, not going to rebound until people get back to work and, and are willing to take the plunge and buy homes. And politically, this will be the theme of the campaign season. And it's the economy stupid, right? Sure. I mean, if you look historically since the Depression, the highest unemployment rate for a president to get reelected was, I think, 7.2 when Reagan got reelected. And, and it, it was trending downwards at the time. The rate now is in, around 9%. Um, you know, if it's in that territory a year from now, uh, or, or around the election in 2012, uh, you know, it would be unprecedented for the Obama to get reelected. So 2012 shapes up as a fundamental pivot point around which philosophy, the Democratic philosophy or the Republican one, can help get us out of these doldrums and improve that jobs picture. I, I don't know about philosophy, but I know if the unemployment rate's 9 percent, I wouldn't want to be an incumbent running for reelection. Whichever mm -hmm. party necessarily. Sure. Yeah. I mean, historically, it just hadn't happened. And, and Greg, I mean, what's going to be the one thing that's going to turn things around for us? It's going to be jobs, obviously, but I mean, what's on the horizon? What's likely? What's, what's the positive picture down the road? Well, positive picture, I mean, if you look locally, uh, two-thirds of uh, home transactions are with cash. That tells me there's a perception of value out there on the part of investors. That, to me, tells me that there's a cushion under home prices. I don't subscribe to the theory that prices are going to fall another 10, 15 percent. So you add some stability to housing, and all of a sudden, at least on a local level, economic things, people start to feel a little bit better. Let's hope that happens. <laughs> more and more and more. We'll be back to wrap it up in just a moment. And our remaining few seconds, uh, final thought now from George Bennett. Only because Brian Crowley's here. <laughs> uh, you know, in this debt deal, President Obama was criticized as being disengaged, and, and a lot of his base was angry at him. And one thing he did get out of this was his overriding concern to have this issue put off beyond the next election. So in that sense, he did definitely benefit from this. And on that note, Joe, or George Bennett and Greg McBride, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank we you. appreciate your time. And we thank you for spending time with us on To The Point. Have a terrific Sunday. Bye-bye.